Who was Enoch? When he was 65 years old, Enoch, the seventh patriarch after Adam, was summoned by God to be a prophet. Though the Bible contains little data about Enoch as a person, we learn in the pearl of great price that he considered himself but a lad and slow of speech. Moses 6.31, when he was summoned by God to be a prophet. Though he begged God, wherefore am I thy servant? Following his call, the Lord taught Enoch and us a bit more about the ancient prophet's divine potential. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Go out and do what I have instructed you to do, and no one shall penetrate you. Open thy lips, and they will be full, and I will give them speech. For all flesh is in my hands, and I will do as seems good to me. Say unto these people, Choose you this day to worship the Lord God who formed you. Behold, my spirit is upon you, wherefore all thy words will I justify. And the mountains will flee before you, and the rivers shall divert from their path. And thou shalt remain in me, and I in you, therefore walk with me. Moses 6.32-34 we see later in Moses that God's promises to Enoch were fulfilled when he led the people of God against their foes. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness, and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language that God had given him. Moses 7.13 As a leader and prophet of the people of God, Enoch met directly with the Lord several times during his 365-year mission. We know this because Enoch experienced several visions of God and walked with him. D and C 107-49 And chatted with him face to face. Moses 7-4 During his ministry, Enoch also constructed a city for the people of God, or people who repented and were baptized. This city, whose residents would subsequently be translated, was known as the city of Enoch or Zion. Where was the city of Enoch built? It's uncertain where the city of Enoch was situated. From the Bible, we know that Enoch moved east out of his country of Canaan to preach repentance to the people. Canaan was the land of promise, named after the great-great-grandson of Adam. Moses 6.17 We also know that Enoch did not preach to the Canaanites, a gang of people responsible for the devastation of the people of Shem. Moses 7-7 Because of this, it is highly probable that Enoch did not journey to the country of Canaan. Moses 7.12 However, we know that he was told to preach to people in the land of Sharon and the land of Enoch, and the land of Omner, and the land of Heni, and the land of Shem, and the land of Haner, and the land of Hananiah. Moses 7-9 So it is feasible that the city of Enoch may have been near these biblical places. When the people of God were attacked, their enemies fled to a land out of the depth of the sea. And so great was the fear of the enemies of the people of God, that they fled and stood afar off, and went upon the land which came up out of the depth of the sea. Moses 7.14, which could have been an island or a peninsula in the general region of the city of Enoch. A possible description we have of where the city of Enoch might have been located is in Moses 7.17, which states that the people of Enoch were blessed upon the mountains and the high places and did flourish, making it possible that the city of Enoch could have been built somewhere in a mountainous region. However, mountains and high places might also denote sanctuaries or places of worship, not necessarily the site of a city. While there are numerous suggestions regarding where the city of Enoch may have been, there's not enough evidence to offer an accurate location of where it was erected. Who dwelt in the city of Enoch and what happened to them? The residents of the city of Enoch were not restricted to one group or tribe of people. Enoch taught repentance to all the people to save the Canaanites because of their wickedness. The residents of the city of Enoch were similarly of one heart and one mind, unified in their convictions, and there were no poor among them. Moses 7:18.
Because of Enoch's teaching and leadership, the inhabitants of the city of Enoch were so holy that the Lord came and dwelt with his people while they were on earth. Moses 7:16. People were eventually transferred and removed from the city of Enoch. There was no implication that people outside the city were out of luck. There were still others living in the city after Zion was removed from the land. Moses 7:27 says, Enoch saw angels descend from heaven bearing testimony of the Father and Son, and the Holy Ghost fell on many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. As for their whereabouts presently, it's highly conceivable that the residents of the city of Enoch remain inside it. However, we know from the history of the church that people who are translated are frequently assigned ministry duties, as with Enoch. Now this Enoch God retained unto himself that he should not die at that time, and gave unto him a ministry unto terrestrial bodies, of whom there has been very little disclosure. He, Enoch, is a ministering angel, ministering to those who will be heirs of salvation, and he appeared unto Jude as Abel did unto Paul. Therefore, Jude spoke of him, history of the church, 4 to 209. It's entirely likely, therefore, that the people of the city of Enoch have ministry assignments of their own and are ministering angels unto many planets. History of the Church, 4 to 210. Where is the city of Enoch now? While talking to the Lord, Enoch showed his entire trust in Zion, saying, Surely Zion shall dwell in safety forever. Moses 7:20. But the Lord's answer suggested there was more in store for the city of Enoch than its earthly habitation. And it came to be that the Lord revealed unto Enoch all the people of the world. And he saw, and lo, Zion, in the course of time, was lifted into heaven. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold my habitation eternally. Moses 7.21 Thus started a picture of what would happen to the planet from then until the millennium, and where Zion would finally be placed. In this vision, Enoch saw the remainder of the world slip into wickedness, with Satan holding a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. Moses 7:26. He saw the God of heaven cry as he gazed upon the evil of the earth and the impending deluge that would annihilate the wicked, events that would not happen for hundreds of years. During this vision, Enoch also glimpsed the holy destiny of Zion. He saw God receive Zion up into his bosom. Moses 7 to 69. We know that the usage of the term bosom in this circumstance indicates more than simply some undefined, heavenly destination. According to the Pearl of Great Price, verse-by-verse -verse commentary, bosom in this context implies God's throne, his real dwelling place. But it wouldn't remain there forever. In Moses 7 to 62 64, we find that the city of Zion will return to the earth during Christ's millennial reign, and righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and the truth will I send forth out of the earth, to bear testimony of my only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yeah, and also the resurrection of all men, and righteousness, and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out my elect from the four quarters of the earth, unto a place which I shall prepare, a holy city, that my people may gird up their loins, and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. Then shall you and all your cities meet them there, and we will welcome them into our bosom, and they will see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they will fall upon our necks, and we will kiss one another. Zion shall grow forth from all the creatures which I have created, and the earth shall rest for a thousand years. Eventually, Enoch and those in the city of Enoch will be reunited with the righteous on earth, according to the Pearl of Great Price. Verse by verse commentary, this will not be just a casual meeting, with receive them into our bosom, not representing a place, but a form of greeting. An expected embrace between righteous people that is accompanied by falling on one another's necks and kissing each other. The reunification of the city of Enoch to the earth in the millennium will be its last resting place and God's residence throughout this 1000 year era. And there shall be my habitation, and it shall be giant, which shall grow forth out of all the creatures which I have created, and for the length of a thousand years, the earth shall rest. Moses 7 to 64. In the book of Enoch, how did 200 angels fall to hell? 
In today's video, we will explore the stories of Lucifer's rebellion and fall, Nephilim giants, and other fascinating tales that have yet to be uncovered in Book 2 of Enoch. Let's dive in. Things changed long ago when 200 angelic beings descended upon Mount Hermon. A Godhead trio, comprised of God the Father, God the Word, and God the Spirit existed once. Although it seems contradictory, they existed before time, during time, and after time. Our perception is limited to our realm. They are not part of our reality. The angelic realm was an infinite realm that God established before the creation of humanity. A third rebelled under Lucifer's leadership and were expelled from the third heaven. The primary idea behind Lucifer's ultimate objective was to usurp the Father's throne and place it above his own. After creating mankind, he became the world's ruler after tricking Eve and Adam into the garden. As a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience, the word of God cursed them. Lucifer set out to taint God's lineage in an effort to evade God's curse. Seth, another son of Adam, was carried on God's bloodline after Cain killed Abel. But Lucifer thought of another scheme and sent 200 of his fallen angels to Mount Hermon, a location on earth, to begin the second part of his evil scheme. His ultimate objective was to thwart the fulfillment of God's promise, which called for the creation of a human savior. I'm going to sow discord between you and the lady, as well as between your seed and her seed. It is going to bruise your head, and you are going to bruise his heel. When he died on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ caused the serpent's head to bruise. The prince of this world is judged now, he declared. The prince of this world has now been banished. Chris may have given Satan a head bruise. Specifically, the devil will be thrown into the fire-burning lake at the end of Christ's millennial rule, which will result in the literal bruising of the serpent's head at the end of the tribulation. Arriving on Mount Hermon, the 200 fallen angels seek to corrupt the pure bloodline. Their main deed was to live among human women and breed a race that would taint the Savior's lineage. Many historians, scientists, and archaeologists have uncovered amazing technological and mechanical achievements from antiquity that surpass our current understanding over time. Unique light bulb generators that appear to illuminate Egyptian structures devoid of flames or reflected light can be discovered in Egyptian artifacts and pictograms. High-tech surgical kits with obsidian scalpels, which are composed of metals superior to our own and are used for cataract, knee, brain, and heart surgery, were discovered in the suitcases of Peruvian witch doctors. Numerous more advanced forms of technology and metal components have been found and preserved in the waters. Among these enigmatic discoveries is a Greek Olympian dial, a relic that has been called the first computer and has the intricacy of a Swiss clock from the 19th century. Not to mention the historical significance of Stonehenge, the Giza pyramids, and the like. Actually, numerous finds show that our old civilization was highly developed at one point. Biblical writings also mention the Nephilim giants, who are thought to have assisted humanity in their technological and mechanical achievements. A number of fallen angels are described in the Book of Enoch as having rebelled against God descended to earth and imparted to humanity such old wisdom. And there were 200 fallen angels in total, they plummeted from Mount Hermon's pinnacle during Jared's days. Along with them, all the other men selected women, each choosing one for himself, and they entered the house and defiled themselves. And they introduced them to plants, told them about charms and enchantments, and demonstrated how to cut roots. They got pregnant and gave birth to enormous giants that ate up all of mankind's possessions. These giants were 3,000 feet in height. And the giants turned on them and ate humanity when men could no longer support them. And Azazel taught men how to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, and other weapons. He also taught them about earthly metals and how to work with them, as well as how to make bracelets, ornaments, antimony, eyelid beautifying, expensive stones of all kinds, and all colored tinctures. And a great deal of godlessness developed, along with immorality and being missled, and turned corrupt in every manner. Simjaza imparted knowledge on charms and root cuttings, while Armaros taught the technique of dispelling charms, Barakijo taught astrology, Kokabel the constellations, Ezekiel the cloud knowledge, Arakiel the earth signs, Shamsiel the sun signs, and Sariel the moon path. Enoch 6. This book claims that 200 fallen angels fell to the summit of Mount Hermon from the heavenly realm. There, they were enthralled by the beauty of human women to the point where they assumed human form and engaged in sexual relations with them. A race of half-angelic, half-human creatures emerged throughout the land as a result of this sin. Genesis 6-4 There is a race called Nephilim Giants. Their wives and children learned a variety of new technological talents from their parents, 
the fallen angels, such as how to make swords, work with metal, cast spells, and more. Using that knowledge, the Nephilim constructed megastructures, cities, machines, and other things. Many people today find it perplexing. We can thus presume that the Nephilim giants possessed their workmanship in antiquated technology and machinery if we consider what the Book of Enoch indicates about how they obtained this knowledge. We might also presume that many of the technological achievements we are seeing now are probably the result of the work of these Nephilim beings. Whatever your point of view, humankind has made enormous strides in the last 150 years. Computers, phones, TVs, circuit boards, radios, vehicles, satellites, microchips, lasers, nuclear weapons, and millions more technological innovations were produced during this period. Things like force fields, teleportation, hover cars, and similar technologies could all be possible in the near future. The majority of people on Earth had had their lives affected by technological explosions, and these are no trivial achievements. However, have you ever taken a moment to sit and consider how these inventions came about so quickly? We have seen tremendous technological developments in the last 150 years that have never been seen before. Why is the quickest means of transportation for 5,000 people were horses, ships, and even on foot yet today we have devices like scooters and cars, and we can even go to the moon and back? Why is there a technological gap? According to my theory, Nephilim and fallen angels have assisted in the development of these technical advancements. These evil entities have access to knowledge that could lead to some of the advancements we witness in the modern era. You may be asking yourself, if Nephilim has existed since the creation of man, why haven't we seen any advancements in the last 150 years? Excellent query. The Bible claims that during Noah's deluge in the year 3000 BC, some of the fallen watcher angels, who were the parents of the Nephilim, were bound in chains and sent to hell. And he has kept in mind the angels who left their own home and did not remain in their own position of power. He has been imprisoned in black eternal chains until the great day of judgment, Joel 1 to 6. Because even the angels who sinned were not spared by God. They are being held captive in the dark, dreary depths of hell until the day of judgment because of what he did to them. 2 14 2 Peter. The really interesting part is that the book of Enoch states that these fallen angels were supposed to be released anew after 70 generations. Hold them, fallen angels, fast in the earth's valleys for 70 generations, until the day of their judgment and fulfillment, until the judgment that lasts forever and ever is fulfilled. 10 Enoch 12. Given that God bound the watcher angels in 3000 BC, they, according to the book of Enoch, are scheduled for liberation after 70 generations. If my calculations are accurate, we would be in the 1900s or 20th century, based on 70 generations x 70 years, or 70 years for each generation. At this very moment, the explosion of information, weapons, global conflicts, technology, and immorality started to occur. In addition, Daniel 12-4 in the book of Daniel predicts a surge in knowledge in the last days. Is this because watcher angels are disseminating their knowledge to the general public? In particular, given that it has been 5,000 years since their last discharge, which occurred around 3000 BC. Consider this, for 5,000 years, there were only modest technological advancements. Humans only had access to walking, horses, carriages, and boats for transportation. We have been entering a new era of vehicles, aircraft, and rocketry since the 1900s, and in a little over 150 years, we will even be visiting the moon. It looks like they have been released from my perspective. Finally, you might be wondering if fallen angels existed on Earth during the technological lag. Yes, that is the response. Other fallen angels do exist because when Satan was expelled from heaven, he took some angels with him. This is probably more than the 200 mentioned in the book of Enoch, even though it wasn't the group of 200 fallen angels that were bound by God for sharing knowledge and having sex with humans. It's also possible that the other fallen angels on earth chose not to provide information out of concern about suffering a penalty akin to that meted out to the 200 as a result of God's retribution. However, since we are in the latter days, God has freed the original 200 angels and taken off his cloak of protection. It's important to keep in mind that devils exist on earth. Fallen angels are not the same as them. The Bible makes a distinction between them, and we need to too. They are also present on earth, corrupting the masses. The next video talks about the prison of the fallen angels in Book 2 of Enoch. Watch the video now.
It is said that hell is the place where the fallen angels, including Azazel and Samyaza, are imprisoned. According to the Book of Enoch, it is a bleak and grim place called Dudale, with an entrance located to the east of Jerusalem. The imprisoned angels are unable to see any light while they are there due to the darkness that covers the place. There isn't much information available online about Dudale, but we are excited to provide you with a detailed description from the Book of Enoch. Before we go into that, it is important to understand the reason behind the fallen angels' imprisonment and suffering. According to Uriel's revelation to Enoch, the prison where the Watchers are held captive is the same place where they would have been confined after committing a sin against God and humanity. Uriel explains in chapter 19 that this is where the angels who had sexual relations with women and caused harm to mankind will stand. They will be punished for leading people astray into worshipping demons as gods and will remain here until the final judgment. This indicates that they will be judged just like humans in the end times. According to Uriel, both man and angel are held to the same standard. Although angels are believed to set better examples and represent the divine, they are not exempt from suffering the same fate as us if they transgress against the Lord. The Anakian legend offers a new perspective on angels by suggesting that fallen angels are eligible for suffering in the end times. In this way, angels are not perfect beings. They are higher than men in their closeness to God, but they are not flawless and appear to possess free will in the same way we do. The Watchers exemplified this by succumbing to the flesh of women and disobeying God's command to descend upon the earth in droves. Uriel's idea is that those angels who demonstrate such behavior will end up in this godless wasteland and suffer until they have been made an end. The Archangel's Involvement with the Fallen Angels In Chapter 20 of the Book of Enoch, the Archangels are described along with their duties. Enoch mentions that Uriel, one of the holy angels, is in charge of the world and Tartarus. It's interesting to note that Enoch uses Tartarus, a concept from Greek mythology, which represents a void in the center of the earth where the Titans were cast by Zeus. This comparison is likely used to draw a connection with readers and to illustrate the void where the Watchers are kept. The Watchers are kept in Dudale, which is a bleak and dire place where God has damned them for their deceit and treachery. In contrast, Zeus only damns the Titans to Tartarus to prevent them from challenging his rule. In this case, one is an act of punishment and the other is an act of war. Enoch then tells us about Raphael, another holy angel who is responsible for watching over the spirits of men. It's possible that Raphael guards the souls of men on earth and protects them in a way that the Watchers fail to do. After the Watchers were dealt with, God tasked Raphael with being the sole watcher of the earth. It's also worth noting that Raphael was an angel of healing, which could explain his role in looking after the spirits of men. In the book of Enoch, Enoch speaks of two angels, Ragiel and Michael. Ragiel is described as a holy angel who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries. The term luminaries is used to refer to the sun, the moon, and the stars in the Bible. In Enochian legend, Angels are believed to be the stars. Ragil is therefore considered to be the punisher for the angels who disobey God's commands. After the fall of the Watchers, God elected Ragil to bring vengeance upon those who fell and to deter other angels from following suit. Michael, on the other hand, is deemed to be one of the holy angels set over the best part of mankind in chaos. He is believed to govern chaos, perhaps in one's life and his presence serves the righteous people by helping them live moral and pious lives. In the Book of Enoch, a new angel named Saraquel is mentioned as one of the holy angels who is responsible for overseeing the spirits that sin in the spirit. It is believed that Saraquel was assigned to watch over the Nephilim spirits, who were not fully destroyed, but allowed to live on earth to bring chaos as punishment for humanity's actions. Enoch refers to these spirits as the ones who sin in the spirit. It is possible that Saracol's duty was to ensure that these spirits did not become too powerful. The Book of Enoch also mentions another holy angel named Gabriel, who is responsible for overseeing paradise, serpents, and cherubim. In the Book of Enoch, we learn about various angels and their responsibilities. One of the most prominent among them is Gabriel, who watches over everything, be it good or bad. Being a messenger angel, Gabriel is aware of the antics of both the holy cherubs and the evil serpents. 
This knowledge helps him alert God to any disturbances that take place, which ensures prompt action and prevents things from getting out of hand, unlike what happened on earth with the Watchers. Another angel mentioned in the book is Remuel, who is responsible for guiding faithful souls into heaven after physical death. He is known for his divine visions and is an angel of hope. In chapter 21 of the book, we read about the prison of the fallen angels, also known as Dudale. Here, Enoch and Uriel venture further into the prison and see something chaotic and horrible. They see seven stars of heaven, representing seven angels, bound together and burning with fire. It is a barren place with no life, and those imprisoned here are trapped by one another and constantly set on fire. Enoch asks Uriel about the reason behind their imprisonment, to which Uriel replies. Uriel's words suggest that the seven angels who are bound and burning may be another group of fallen angels, separate from the Watchers. Unlike the Watchers who are condemned to suffer forever, these angels have a limited sense of 10,000 years of suffering. Enoch asks why these angels are bound, and Uriel explains that they are among the stars of heaven who broke the Lord's commandment. They must remain bound until their sins are fully atoned for. The nature of their transgressions is not revealed, but it is clear that they committed a significant offense to receive such a harsh punishment. Enoch recounts being taken to a place even more terrible than the previous one he had visited. He describes a vast area filled with pillars of fire descending into an abyss, so immense that he could not see where they began. Enoch expresses fear and dread at the sight, and it appears that witnessing the punishment of divine angels may have triggered existential regret and panic. He confides in Uriel, who does not display much sympathy or understanding, highlighting the fundamental difference in mindset between humans and angels. Enoch explains that he is fearful of the place and the pain he is witnessing, to which Uriel responds with bafflement, asking why Enoch is afraid at all. Enoch seemed anxious, but Uriel didn't resonate with his feelings. However, Uriel understood Enoch's fear on some level and tried to reassure him by stating that this is where the fallen angels end up. Though Uriel's casual demeanor did not provide much comfort to Enoch, it might be inferred that he was trying to convey the idea that mankind would not tolerate such torture, and thus, the punishment would not be the same for humans. Despite the fact that Uriel's statement was not particularly comforting, it may have helped Enoch put the idea of punishment into perspective, making him even more determined to save himself and his fellow man. Enoch understood the extremities of suffering and did not want anyone to experience the same things he had seen. Uriel concluded this chapter ominously, telling Enoch in a callous tone, This place is the prison of the angels, and here they will be imprisoned forever. The next video talks about the dead spirit of the Nephilim. Watch the video now. God bless you. Enoch saw the hidden things of heaven after being informed that he was the chosen one by a whirlwind that carried him to the west. He saw mountains made of lead, gold, soft metal and copper, as well as mountains made of iron, copper and silver. He asked the angels accompanying him, What are these? The angels replied, The things you have seen will support the Messiah authority so that he can be strong and mighty on the earth. Wait a little while, and everything that surrounds the Lord of Spirits will be made known to you. In the presence of the elected ones, these mountains of priceless metals that you have seen will melt like wax before a fire and crumble beneath his feet, just like water does when it falls from the sky. And it will happen that no one will be saved who relies on gold and silver. There won't be any materials for breastplates or iron for use in battle. The lead will be useless and the bronze tin and other materials will be worthless. As mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ is referred to as the Messiah, the elected one or the chosen one in Hebrew and Jewish teachings, among a great many other names. After hearing the angels, Enoch saw a deep valley with an open mouth. All the island, the seas and the land filled the valley with gifts and everything they could bring, but it never filled completely. Likewise, everything the righteous work for is devoured by sinners without any thought of reward. They will be destroyed in front of the Lord of Spirits and exiled from his planet. When Enoch peered into the valley, he saw that all of the angels of punishment lived there and were busy making all of the satanic adversaries' weapons and instruments. Enoch subsequently questioned, For whom are they preparing these instruments? The angel replied, The preparers for the earth's king and powerful 
so that they can use it to destroy themselves or be destroyed by it. In that case, the elected ones will appear in this congregation in the name of the Lord of Spirits and the righteous will be free from the operations of the sinners. Enoch turned to another part of the earth as he heard this and saw another deep valley, but this one was filled with burning fire. He saw the king and the powerful being cast into it. He asked the angels, who are these chains prepared for? After noticing large chains of immeasurable weight, as he peered deeper into the valley, they are being prepared for the host of Azazel, the angel replied, so that they may be cast into the bottom of the pits of hell and covered with rough stones as the Lord of Spirits commanded, to ensure that the Lord of Spirits exact justice on them for their unrighteousness and for leading those who live on earth astray. Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Phanuel will seize them on that day and cast them into the furnace of fire. The passage continues to briefly describe the events of the great flood that occurred during the days of Noah. After Enoch had ascension into the heavens, after the angels had finished speaking, Phanuel is another name for the angel Uriel, the Lord of Spirits who joined the water of the heavens and the water below the earth. Enoch had ascension into the heavens. After the angel Uriel had finished speaking, Phanuel is another name for the angel Uriel, the Lord of Spirits joined the waters of the heavens and the waters below the earth during the time of Noah by opening all the reservoirs of the water above heaven and the fountain beneath the earth's surface. With the water above the sky being masculine and the water below the earth being feminine, all those who reside on dry land as well as everything below the ends of the heaven were destroyed by the water combined ferocity. After everything had been destroyed, the Lord of Spirits remorsefully declared, I have destroyed everyone who lives on the earth in vain. I won't ever treat them in that way again. As long as the heaven is above the earth, I will place a sign in the heavens that will serve as a covenant between me and them, a symbol of his covenant and promise to never again wipe out the earth and the descendants of Noah's by flood. The Lord of Spirits caused a rainbow to appear in the sky. The Lord of Spirits said, My angels shall take hold of them on the day of tribulation, and I shall unleash my punishment and wrath upon them, speaking to those who offend him. You, powerful kings of the earth, who witness my chosen ones sit on the throne of glory and rule in my name over Azazel, all of his allies and all of his hosts. Following this, Enoch observed the punishments of angels traveling with iron and bronze chains and scourges in their hands. He then asked the angel, Where are they going? Who will they trample on their foot? Each angel is going to the person they have chosen and to their loved ones so that they can all be thrown into the valley of abyss. The angel replied, Their lives will come to an end, their days will no longer be measured, and the valley would be populated by both the people they chose and their loved ones in order to get the kings to charge out like lions from their dens and wolves from their park. The angels will march to the east of the Parthians and Medes. They will be overtaken by a restless spirit which will cause them to ascend and trample all surrounding areas but leave the city of the righteous untouched. They will turn against one another and fall through their own faults onto their countless corpses and they have massacred themselves. Man will not know his brother, son, father or mother. When the pits of hell opens its mouth to swallow them, their demise will be complete. In the presence of the righteousness, he will eat up sinners and everyone will prostrate themselves before the Lord of the spirits. Enoch informs us, I then moved on to the chaotic area and I witnessed something dreadful there. I did not see a stable earth or heaven above, only a chaotic and awful place. And there, like huge mountains of fire, I saw seven stars of heaven bound together within. In this passage, Enoch claims to have seen Enoch claims to have seen seven stars in the sky or seven angels who were chained together and engulfed in flames. We get a glimpse of what life is like for those who are imprisoned here and how they are trapped by one another and constantly set on fire. From the outside, this place appeared to be lifeless and barren. Then Enoch tells us that he was taken to another location, possibly deeper inside the prison, and that it was much worse than the first. He informs us, and from there I went to another place, still more terrible than the first, and I saw a horrible thing, a great fire there, burning and blazing, and a place was cleft as far as the abyss, being full of great descending columns of fire, neither its extent nor magnitude could I see, nor could I conjecture. Enoch described this place as being covered in enormous fire pillars that he was unable to see the beginning. The burning of the angels may have caused Enoch to feel existential regret and panic 
because if God was willing to allow this to happen to his angels who were closest to him and divine, then his punishments for mankind may have been even more horrifying despite the fact that he makes no comments. Enoch expresses his fear by calling this the most horrible and terrible place he has yet to see. Even Uriel hears him express his fear by saying, how fearful is the place and how terrible to look upon. However, Uriel does not seem to be particularly compassionate and appear more perplexed by the fact that Enoch is scared at all, demonstrating the mentality gap between men and angels. Their tolerance for such things is infinitely higher than ours. Why hast thou such fear and affright? He asks Enoch, because of this terrifying place and because of the spectacle of the pain. Enoch responds, even though Enoch's anxiety does not seem to be shared by Uriel, the angel tries to ensure him by explaining that this is where the fallen angels are ultimately sent. Uriel might have been telling Enoch with this statement along with casual demeanor that he needed to be afraid. After all, this suffering was definitely from what mankind can anticipate given that we wouldn't have the same tolerance for it, although it wasn't exactly reassuring to hear. Belial, known as Hell's brightest fire, Evil's match and the king of evil, is the 68 spirits in the Gothia and one of the four crowned princes of hell, ruling over the north. After the fall of the angels, he was against God and heaven. Though likely this was due to his slot, he would eventually decide to continue to be a part of the Stingian council and became a king of hell. Belial is a mighty and powerful king as he was created right next to Lucifer and is of his order. His office is to distribute preferment of censorship and to cause favor of friends or foe. He bestows excellent familiars and governs eight legions of spirits. Whoever summons him must have offerings of gifts or sacrifices or he will not give true answers to their demands. But even then, he will not spend more than one hour on the truth unless constrained by divine power or his seal. In the mansion of Isaiah, Belial is a demon of lawlessness and the ruler of this world. Belial is also the patron of secrets, domination, and seduction. He is a profane being, revealing in the pleasure and pain of flesh. He resides in the city of Abrimoch, in a place of jagged obsidian buildings on one leap of the Caledra. Belial's name means worthlessness in Hebrew and later came to represent the personification of the devil. In the Old Testament of the Bible, the word tends to be used to describe a class of people. For instance, the son of Belial, the New Testament introduced Satan as the ruler of evil. But prior to that, Belial was said to be his predecessor. In the monology, he is one of Lucifer's most notable demon source recounting. He was the demon that indirectly created the Nosferatu, known as Count Orox. He is also the father of demoness Friena and the Cambion Iliana Roth. Before his fall from Greece, Belial appeared in the form of a beautiful angel sitting in a chariot of fire and spoke with a calmly voice. He, after his fall, he became the demon of lies and guilt and is able to induce any type of sin, especially those related to sex and lust. Sebastian Mitchells states that Belial, seduced by the means of arrogance and his adversary is Saint Francis of Paolo. In this sense, his name is translated as Lord of Arrogance or Lord of Pride. Belial is associated with the immoral atheists, magicians, or perhaps anyone going against the grain. Belial is the partner of the demon Necromancer Nibros and the uncle of Figo of Alice. The name Belial means without a master and symbolizes true independence, self-sufficiency, and personal accomplishments. Belial represents the earth elements, is the master of mankind and the champion of humanity, and represents the kernel and the base urge of humans, which is highly similar to Satan himself. Belial also means worthless, meaning that the children of Belial literally means the children of worthless. The word is used in the Hebrew context to describe many debased concepts or persons, such as those who support or encourage the worship of other gods, those who have committed sex crimes or rabble rousers. The war in heaven. Belial was one of many great angels, a cherub to be precise, that joined Lucifer's crusade against the highest and the tyranny of heaven. Being of Lucifer's order, Belial was a very powerful and respected angel and as a result was a formidable force. During the war in heaven, 
acting as the first lieutenant alongside Kofmog. He was soon defeated and cast out alongside Lucifer and the other fallen angels into the abyss, which then became hell. Plans of attack After establishing a kingdom within hell, Belial was among the fallen angels that was part of the Stygian Council. He and his devilish cohorts debated amongst each other on what to do to strike back against God. Belial is almost a caricature of the slimy politicians. His words are honeyed, his appearance pleasing, and his arguments persuasive, but his thoughts were low. He uses his orthocultural gifts to counter Moloch's arguments for an immediate attack upon heaven, addressing each of Moloch's points in turn. First of all, he asserts that the whole enterprise would be not just doubtful, as Moloch characterized it, but fundamentally hopeless, whether they attempted to sneak into heaven or launch a full frontal assault, the ultimate result would be the same. After they had done their worst, yet our great enemy, all incorruptible, would on its throne sit unpolluted, for even hell has no power to destroy that which created the world. Of course, Moloch had himself allowed a strong possibility of defeat, but claimed that even this would be better than a life of exile. Belial dismisses this claim. He does not accept to die. To be swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated nights would be superior to continued existence under present circumstance. This is an arguable point, being as it is something of a value judgment. More compellingly, though he knows that the devil's present circumstance is hardly the worst that God could do to them if they angered him again. Indeed, they have ex already experienced much worse. After Satan's victory in tempting man, Billy Ali was among the devils that were turned into serpents by God in retribution. Billy Ali's rebellion. Billy Ali's rebellion. Thousands of years later, Billy Ali attains the coronation of Mundus, the son of Lucifer and Lilith, crowned as the new emperor of the Inferno. Whilst being aware of the fact that Mundus absurd the throne rather than inherit it outright, while Belialis was content not to make any further action against God, as he knew it was a hopeless endeavor, he was growing increasingly frustrated with Mundus' ways of ruling hell and held the Dark Emperor in high contempt and disdain. Throughout those years, however, Belial had gained an infamous reputation with demons calling him the Bright Fire of Hell or the evil's brightest middle match. During these years, he fathered the demoness Freyana with Agra Parmrafa and a Carbionan girl that would become to be known as Lillian Roth in the modern days from a crow witch. Inevitably, Belial reached his breaking point and declared that he would be under Mundus' rule no longer, sparking a civil war in hell. Mundus knew that Belial posed a great threat to his rule, not just because of his power, also, his influence as Belial was quite a powerful speaker and could coax numerous demons to his side, befitting of one who is a politician of sorts in the Stygian Council, like other high-ranking demons. Moreover, Mundus was still in the early years of his reign and had not amassed enough control over the Inferno, so he resorted to having Beelzebub deal with the situation. Beelzebub gathered the Knights of Hell to fight back Belial's force with great succession. Among these knights was the legendary Dark Knight himself, Sparta, whose personality forced Belial in a titanic battle. After a long and hard fought duel, Sparta defeated the almighty Devil King, before casting him into the Caucasus River. Return and revenge. After the apocalypse, its effects reverberated across the realms, and among them was hell. Many barriers that held dangerous and powerful entities were weakened and allowed these entities to leak out into the material world to threaten it once more. After Lucifer's defeats and Satan's imprisonment, a powerful vacuum was created in hell, with demons and fallen angels fighting for control over the throne. However, Belial was set free from the frozen lake of Kaikotos, weakened from the effects of the apocalypse, and was burning with a fiery vengeance against Mundus of Sparta. Power and Abilities Being of Lucifer's order, when he was an angel and later becoming a high rank demon of hell, Belial is the most just powerful demon. In the distant past, Belial posed a large threat to even Mundus himself and his reign as a whole, which made Trish believe that Belial could have more than likely defeated Mundus when the Dark Emperor was at his prime. As an angel, 
particularly of the cherubim order. Belial was able to slay numerous angels during war in heaven and as a demon slaughtered large demonic armies that attempted to move against him or any of other seven great kings. He was even capable of fighting Sparta, who was also in his prime for a long period of time before being defeated by the Dark Knight. After his subsequent release from Quercotus, Belial's power and strength had not weakened nor was he hampered in any way, as he remained just as powerful as he always was even after being imprisoned within Quercotus for thousands of years. His emergence from hell to earth created a tremor that was felt by supernatural psychics from miles away, and his first display of power was destroying New Mexico in a burst of hellfire by simply flicking his index ring finger upward. He was capable of holding his own against multiple werewolves simultaneously before effortlessly besting them. Myths and legends, Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Angel of Light and the Angel of Darkness are mentioned. God is cited as the Angel of Light and Belial is the contrary. The demon was said to be bringing guilt and wickedness to man. The source also recounts a dream of Ammon, the father of Moses, where Belial is described as the king of evil or prince of darkness. 